What is the life sciences economy or the biotechonomy as you like to refer to it? So one of the things that's happening is we're transitioning from reading and writing in ABCs to writing in ones and zeros, and that's been mostly economic growth for the last 30 years. The Googles, the Ebays, the YouTubes, the Twitters all come out of this one and zero alphabet. Now what's happening is we're beginning to understand how to write life code, how to write our genes, how to write cells. We just made the first synthetic cell. And that's going to change almost every business on this planet, much as the ability to write in ones and zeros has changed how we drive our cars, turn on our lights, take photographs, watch television, talk to our grandkids. This is like Fairchild building the first mass-produced semiconductor? That's exactly right. There was a digital economy before that, because Babbage made machines and mechanical abacus and all kinds of things, but the transistor made it practical and led to this huge Silicon Valley economy that then spread to Bangalore and Malaysia and Taiwan and Singapore and the rest of these places. Now what we're beginning to be able to do is not just insert single genes, but to write the entire gene code of a cell from scratch. And that's going to change how we make energy, how we make lubricants, how we make textiles, how we make medicines. Almost every business in this world is going to change because of this ability. How do you turn it into revenue? And more importantly, how do you turn it into wealth? How has this become a driver for growth over time? Well, one of the things that most people haven't realized yet is that they, they think of this life science economy as a bunch of little Cambridge kooky startups. And what's actually happened is companies like DuPont, which are huge chemical companies, are now getting 33% of their total revenues from life sciences. General Electric is getting about 14% from healthcare and life sciences. The biggest single area of growth and use of IT is becoming life science databases. And, and what you're watching is very large companies across the whole of the economy are beginning to produce more and more of what they make for life sciences or out of life sciences. That does, though, present us with some challenges. The digital economy isn't particularly controversial. The life sciences economy is, on the other hand, quite controversial. A life sciences database is one thing, but genetically modified foods is another, and not everybody is on board with that, and we haven't even begun to approach the debate that is going to surround synthetic biology. How do we overcome those kinds of obstacles? I think you're absolutely right, and, and I think there's three sections to this. One is we have to make sure that this isn't used for ill, and we have to strengthen things like biological weapons treaties. The second thing is there's going to be a series of ethical debates, and those ethical debates are going to be important. But the third part of this, which is, I think, just as important, is we've now doubled the lifespan of human beings over the last century. And we're about to increase it again to the point where I think our kids will live to 100, 120, 130. Really? Without that much trouble. And they'll probably be running on Miami Beach doing marathons on regrown body parts. And we're gonna, things are going to change in a pretty substantial, interesting way. This sounds like science fiction to most people, but you think that this, some of these advances could be realized in your lifetime, in my lifetime, such that we'll begin to see it affect the welfare of our children? Well, I think we're Maybe even our own welfare. Oh, it, it's absolutely changing our own welfare. Um, let me give you two examples. One of the reasons why we're able to keep wounded soldiers alive in Afghanistan and Iraq is because there's been an enormous regenerative medicine effort, and there's been a whole series of things that we can now do with biology and treatments that are pretty extraordinary. To give you a single example, Anthony Atala at Wake Forest is regrowing bladders and that's allowing women who've had cancer to walk around with their own bladders instead of plastic bags the rest of their life. Tony's working on 42 arts. Last three weeks when I was there, he was printing skin using these little inkjet cartridges, and he filled them with cells instead of with ink, and he was just sitting there printing layers of skin. And then, if you want to try this at home, the latest catalog for Harvard Biosciences allows you to buy a little reactor that will allow you to print a beating mouse heart out of cells, which is kind of neat for your kids. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be trying it at home, at least not right now. But let's talk about uh, things from a financial perspective for a moment, because the wreckage of companies that didn't make it in the digital economy could make mountains. Yep. I can only imagine we're going to see something similar come out of the life sciences economy. If you're an investor, 
how do you play this? How do you play it in such a way that you aren't going to lose your shirt because so many companies will go bust? Well, look, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely correct. If, you know, if you'd been programming on the machines that Bill Gates was programming on, you would have bought Altair stock and gone broke. And then you would have bought Tandy 2, and then you would have bought Commodore 64, and then you would have bought the Fortune 500 standard, which was Wang. And then you would have gone out and bought Apple or too early. And the answer is, this stuff is littered with a whole bunch of roadkill. But if your conclusion had been, I should never invest in anything digital, then you would have missed most of the economic growth that happened over the last 20 or 30 years. So I think the same thing's going to happen in life sciences. And I think what you do is you diversify. And you diversify by investing in folks who really know the science part as well as the business part. This is not a playpen for strictly MBAs. This is, you've got to be science literate. You've got to understand what is hocus pocus and what's for real. But there's so much money invested over the last 30 years. There's so much NIH funding. There's so much university funding that, for instance, on the gene diagnostic space, we've moved from the human genome in 2000 to high-end research universities to high-end hospitals. And now it's moving into all of our doctor's offices. And it's making a huge difference in treatment of cancer. I'll give you one example. You can now treat cancer, colorectal cancer, using a generic drug for a tenth of the price with three times the improvement in lifespan simply by getting the dosage right. And, and those kinds of tweakings are what gives me hope in this healthcare system. What are some of the watchwords we should be careful for? Everybody ought to approach this industry as a skeptic, not a cynic. Uh, we all remember eyeballs and what that ultimately meant to the dot-com economy, not a whole lot. What are some of the words that we're going to start hearing from some of these life sciences evangelists that we need to be careful for? I think anybody who overpromises in this stuff, look, biology is nasty, it's messy, it's, it's redundant. If you were designing a computer chip, you would drive an engineer crazy because an engineer tries to make it with the least, most elegant number of components. Biologists go exactly the opposite way. Everything's redundant. It looks like the internet. It's a messy, varied, complex, interactive system. It's almost a like chaos theory. And anybody who shows up and says, I've got an answer, you know, make sure it's peer reviewed, make sure it's published, make sure that they can run the experiment. And in our particular investment strategy, we look for very broad platforms and be used across industries and don't depend on a yay or nay from the FDA at various phases.